been asked to speak about uh, really about two topics today. Number one, uh, growth and, and challenges and how we took on those challenges at Quick Trip Associated with the growth. And number two, a uh, topic that's on everybody's mind right now, and that's retention and, and really even gaining employees for us at this point. And so that's uh, kind of where we're going to start, but we're going to weave in the uh, Quick Trip story along the way because a lot of our opportunities and challenges have come from that. Uh, I look at where we've come from and where we've been. We started in 1965 in Eau Claire, Wisconsin with one C store. It was an offshoot of Gateway Foods at that point uh, and, and owned by Gateway Foods. Uh, a few years later, uh, the Reinhardt family, the uh, Zitlow family, and the John Hansen family split the company three ways and were invited to buy in. And so from 1972 to 1989, we actually had three families working together to guide the company. Uh, and then in 1989, the uh, Reinhardt family got out and it was the Hansen and Zitlow families for the next 11 years until the year 2000 and in the year 2000 the Zitlow family uh, bought out uh, the Hansen family and that's where we've been uh, for the last 17 years and growing uh, to roughly 650 stores as we stand today. Uh, and really that's one of the first challenges I just wanted to uh, touch on is working with family. <laughs> <laughs> and carrying a family business into the next generations. It's, a, it's been an enormous challenge for us. Uh, Don and LaVon, uh, the patriarch and matriarch of the family, Don still comes in the office every day. He's 83 years old, he still puts in, well, he definitely puts in more hours than I do. Uh, but then when you combine the three kids and their spouses, uh, 14 grandchildren, uh, five of them are married, and now you've got 30 people in a room uh, working towards continuing the company for the next 50 years. Uh, and you know, Don always throws it out there, I've got it 50 years, I'm, I'm out, you guys got the next 50 years. Uh, the three in the second generation don't work directly within the company. They've all chosen outside careers, uh, and yet they all serve on our board of directors. And the picture you see there on the slide, the deck would be the four of us in the third generation, and actually myself and one other our spouses that have chosen to make our careers within Quick Trip as a whole. And so getting everybody on that same page and moving everybody forward has lot, led to lots and lots of discussions. In fact, 10 years ago, we made a conscious effort uh, to dedicate two weekends a year conjoined with our board meeting uh, that the family would be all be invited to. We were always invited, but made it a priority to come in and spend the rest of the weekend learning about Quick Trip, whether you work there or not, and learning about everything that goes into owning a company, uh, regardless of size estate issues, trust issues, will issues, uh, how do you deal with perks, <laughs> what is your benefits policy, how do you deal with all those types of things. And so that's been huge for us and in fact uh, we made great strides forward roughly two months ago and we formed a family council. Uh, we've worked with our outside advisory group, we've got to work with a company out of Chicago, uh, the family lawyers, the family accountants, all those people and said, you know, really, as much as the ideas as we have, you guys need to drive this for you to be successful into the future. And so there's currently uh, four of our third generation sits on that board. I kind of said, nope, uh, the work day is enough for me. I don't want to discuss it with you guys at night. Uh, you tell me what tickets I can and can't have and we'll go from there. Uh, but really they're dealing with everything from family employment uh, to making sure that as the third generations, the rest of them come on board, we talk about those things like a prenuptial agreement to make sure that the stock could stay in the families, uh, you know, if something catastrophic happened to an individual or something went south with a spouse. And so you're dealing and tackling all those issues. And really what it comes down to, and this is a huge part of how we retain our coworkers as well as our mission statement. Uh, something the family sat down and, and really got to work on roughly 15 years ago, the G2s before the G3s got old enough. Uh, but you see it there and this is who we are. This is who we strive to be when we grow up at some point. Uh, but it's to serve our customers and community more effectively than anyone else by treating our customers, coworkers, and suppliers as we personally would like to be treated. And then in 2007 we added that last phrase and to make a difference in someone's life. And we can do that selling, you know, whatever, fuel and fast food. We can do it. We honestly believe we can do it. And again, this is one of those things that holds companies together. If uh, anybody's read the business author Tom Collins, uh, his built book to last, this is what it comes down to in, in his uh, analysis. I think his book came out in the early 90s. But companies that are on board with a mission statement, that everybody knows the mission statement and everybody's driving forward with the mission statement, uh, in his analysis from 26 to 1990, those companies beat the market average by 16 times. Wow. Just because everybody in the company knew our mission statement, or knew their mission statement. And so we hit our mission statement in every single meeting. 
We hit our mission statement when we get together with our coworkers. We talk about why we do it and what we do it. Uh, if you were at our ribbon cutting in Vadnais Heights, all of our coworkers know it. Uh, we did an in-house interview th you know, qu uh, quiz here about three years ago, and out of 4,000 people we talked to at a year-end me meeting, uh, we missed eight people. And so when everybody's on board pulling the same way, it's huge as far as longevity and where you go from there. And if nothing else, you remember your job at Quick Trip is to make a difference. And then when I work on, because I'm not just public relations, but I get to spend time in our training department as well, it's the, the positive difference because we can ruin people's day too, especially in the retail industry if we do something wrong. And so we wanna be that positive difference for people day after day, because uh, we see most of our guests, you know, a lot of our guests, in fact, three, four, sometimes <laughs> 10 times a week. Uh, and from there, it's about establishing our priorities, and this is something that we've laid out for quite some time, people. People are number one priority for us. We'll wrap the presentation up with that. Uh, but then from there, food and vertical integration. Uh, through the 70s and 80s, we were really every other C store, Cokes and Smokes. That's what we sold. And then the late 80s, early 90s, we started to move into food. And then from there, in, in 2002, Thanksgiving weekend of 2002, we got into the hot food and what you see the hot, in the hot spot at the front of the store, which has really just been significant for us. And in regard to our hot food, this is really what separates us, and our food in offering in general is what separates us from other C stores. Uh, if you recall, I said we started out uh, as a sub, as a you know, offshoot of Gateway Foods, Don was a gr grocery wholesaler, and so we started off. Our first seven stores did not have fuel. We were the and through the you know, the 60s and 70s, grocery stores were getting bigger and bigger. You're losing the corner grocery store, and the original idea was to bring the corner gro grocery store back. And so that's what those first kind of couple stores were. And then we got into the C store industry, and then in the 80s, we really began to drive back in with our commodities. Uh, but our bakery in the cross, we've got almost 400 coworkers there that make all the bread, uh, all the you know, buns, bagels, sweet goods, everything. And they make three and a half million cookies and donuts a week. We run about 60,000 loaves of bread a day through those, uh, those guys. And part of our growth strategy is keeping our stores in stock. And so we're right, right now we're about halfway through the process. We're in the middle of construction of about a $115 million bakery in the cross. It's going to do bread and buns, and then when that's done, uh, we'll convert our current bakery into only sweet goods, uh, just to be able to keep the stores in stock, and away we go. Uh, from there, what really sets us apart is those that baked milk. You know, you just don't see it everywhere unless you're in Quebec or Europe. Uh, there's only two other dairies in the state of Wisconsin that even do it, and they only have uh, supply directly from their dairy. We process about a million pounds of milk a day right now. Well, you get about a half of our milk from Plainview, Minnesota, a cooperative down there, and then we get the other half from a cooperative in La Crosse area. Uh, but we get farm direct milk, and because of our vertical integration, because of some things we'll talk about in a minute, uh, from the time the farm trucks pull into our, our dock bays to unload milk to the time that milk gets into your grocery store or your C store, your quick trip up here a couple blocks away in Vadnais Heights, uh, is typically about a 30 hour turnaround. Because of our vertical integration, we can beat our competition in freshness. And so we can be able to do all these ice creams and gelatos and anything with that Nature's Touch logo on it out of our dairy, we make ourselves. We can get it to you faster and pre fresher. Uh, we control, and more importantly, we can control the safety and quality of the product. And same thing with our kitchens, our kitchen cravings lines, our pizzas, our salads, our soups. We do those all in house in our commissary in La Crosse. Uh, we rolled out about 22,000 salads yesterday that got shipped out to the stores. Uh, made them yesterday morning, distributed them in the D.C. last night. They're on trucks rolling out to Minnesota this morning, tonight. Uh, what was made today will be out in trucks rolling out to Wisconsin tonight. And so we do all those things in-house. Again, because we can control the safety, we can control the quality, uh, it just gives us a step up, that leg up on the competition. Uh, moving into our, and really the hub of it, and again, this is what a, a, a challenge, that how do you get fresh donuts out to two harbors when you're on the cross, you know? And a lot of it comes down to our DC. We run two 10-hour shifts. Uh, we load the trucks and they drive them at night and the empty trailers come back and we load them all back up again. Uh, what you see there is our banana ripening room in that picture. Uh, last year we sold about 50 million pounds of bananas. When you do the math on that, an average uh, one of our stores goes through about 480 pounds of bananas a day. And again, it's something that you looked at and said in the, in, uh, bananas came about in 1993. And in the writings on the wall, it's been on the wrong for a long time with cigarettes and tobacco. And so how are we going to replace that? Well, let's get into produce. 
I know how to do produce. I'm a gold grocery guy. Uh, so we start. We actually struck a deal with Hershey to get bananas in our store. So it's about that outside the box problem solving and thinking. Uh, we had a, at that time, you know, like candy bars. That's what you stopped for when you went to a, a C store or a gas station. So we struck a deal with Hershey's and said, if you build the rack, we'll put your candy bars front, front and center when you walk in the store, but we get the top shelf for bananas. <laughs> they were a little hesitant, but eventually they struck up the deal. And we, you know, and again, that's the, the value of being a privately held family owned company. Don said this is going to work. We threw away more bananas than we sold for a number of years. But Don said, this is going to work, stay behind it. And so three, four years in, we're finally at a 50-50 split. And you know, here we are, that was 93, so 20 some years later, uh, we're doing 50 million pounds of bananas uh, a year. And they just keep rolling. And so what that is, is a banana ripening room. When we get uh, bananas, uh, we buy from Del Monte out of Central America. When they come in, uh, they're very, very green and rock hard. So essentially, this is the brown bag on your cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> we stick them in there, and they sit for three or four days at the, the right humidity conditions. And of course, the bag is to hold the ethylene gas that fruit naturally gives off as it ripens. Uh, and they come out and we ship them in green and yellow stages. So if you want to come in and buy bananas for on your way to work for breakfast that morning, you can do it. If you want to have them for the week and get a green, you know, some bananas in the green stage, you can do that as well to have for some uh, bananas for the week. Uh, but really it's, it's those type of ideas. And then again, we can control the product. From all those production facilities, we cross dock in our DC, we get them out the door that day or that night uh, to our stores, wherever they may be in our network. And we do that through convenience transportation. Uh, last year, our commercial fleet drove 27 million miles. Uh, we supply over 95% of all the gasoline and diesel to all of our stores through 20-some terminals throughout the market area. And of course, we've got trucks rolling every day and night uh, to get the products to your stores out of our distribution center. And so you see the stats here. We've got almost 500 drivers in the company. And really, again, that's one of those things that separates us from other C stores is when you go to a store, you see a C store, and we look, don't look that much different than Holiday or Circle K or Casey's. Uh, but when you look at everything behind it, that's what allows us to be different and separate ourselves from the pack. Uh, there again, it's one of those things I have amazing respect for. Uh, Don grew up on the dairy farm. His first job off the farm was driving truck. And so our drivers, when he walks into the room, and uh, they know he's done the job. And that's something we try to carry with, with those of us who have uh, uh, chosen to go full time within the company as well. Uh, during our family weekends that I mentioned previously, we always open it up for any family member to go work in any area and do like a you know, one day job shadow. Uh, but the last three weeks, I've actually been in, out in our production floors, and they've had me mixing the chocolate milk and trying to wrap the sandwiches. And it was not necessarily pretty, and it took time out of everybody's schedule to make up for my lack of wrapping skills in the sandwiches. Uh, but it's just as important that I know those jobs as I know what's going on in retail. So when, it, it, when those tough decisions come uh, at a board level one day or when family discussions, I have a clue as to what I'm talking about. And so we open that up, and anybody that works full time as a family member is this expected to work their way through the company. And so I've been sprinkling that in as I go. And it's been just a blast to learn all these different roles. I found out that delivering fuel below zero is kind of a miserable job. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, they have to stand within 10 feet of that tanker at all times. So when you're dropping fuel at night, when it's 20 mile an hour winds and 15 below zero, you gotta be ready to shut that thing down if something goes wrong. And so those guys earn every penny they get. And it's just that gaining that appreciation, that's really what Don wants us to do by working our way through. We don't have to be there long, but we have to know what's going on and understand it. And really the big thing that's come about for us, uh, something that we never thought we'd be into, uh, but once we started doing the hot food in 2003, it wasn't too long uh, where you started seeing all these things pop up in the news about foodborne illnesses. And because of the rapid advances in, in technology and microbiology, uh, you are 50 times more likely today than you were two years ago to have a foodborne illness traced back to you. Uh, there's basically two things that Don uh, will tell you, and I have this great privilege where I'm in public relations. Don still goes to all the ribbon cuttings because, again, we said a people are a priority. So he, we spend 10 to 15,000 miles a year uh, of windshield time together. And uh, Carl, there's there's couple things that will bring this company down. Number one, if the banks won't give us money anymore. Uh, number two, if we run out of people. And number three, if we get somebody sick or worse yet, kill somebody. 
And, and so we take food safety very seriously. We have our own biology lab on campus, microbiology, the only PhD in the company. Uh, but we run 3,000 samples a week. We test everything from the incoming lettuce, and we do shelf life testing. Uh, we swab our trailers. We wash out our trailers once a week. Think about it. If we got people going in and out of production and in and out of the DC and in and out of the stores, and then we're putting food in the trailer, we better be washing those trailers out, making sure that even the trailer floor is cleaned at least once a week. And so we're doing all those things to keep you safe. And again, the vertical integration aspect of it. Nobody else in the C-Store industry is doing these things. When we can control the product, we, we can control the quality for start to finish, it's better for you, our guests. And along the way, we save money, which again, we can pass those savings on to you, our guests. And so that's the goal of vertical integration. Uh, you see there, 80% of the products that we sell in our stores come through our distribution center. Uh, a lot of your DSD vendors, your Coke, your Pepsi, and so on, uh, you know, we can't do that with. But we even stamp our own cigarettes. We bring them in from the major cigarette manufacturers. We stamp them with the tax stamps for Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa, and we ship them back out the door. We can save, you know, even a hundredth of a cent, and it, away you go. Uh, what you see there is actually our milk jug facility. If we're bottling and processing a million pounds of milk a day, you gotta bottle it to get it out to the store. When you're buying milk jugs and you're paying transportation costs, you're paying to ship air. <laughs> and so three years ago, we, we started making our own one gallon jugs. And when you make your own one gallon jug and you save two cents a jug, but you're making eight jugs every seven seconds, the savings add up really rapidly. And so this machine runs 23 hours and 40 minutes a day. The other 20 minutes are maintenance. And I'll be putting a second one in next summer because we don't have the capacity we need right now. And so all those things give us that competitive advantage. And a lot of it just comes, again, from the family aspect, being able to try new things. We can go out on a ledge and try things. And so we were one of the first companies in the country to have a guest-facing uh, cappuccino, you know, the, the actual espresso drink. Essentially, it was the same machine McDonald's had behind the counter, but instead of taking labor to do it, you guys are intelligent people. You can watch, operate touch screens. I watched you do it all lunch. <laughs> and so you can go up and make your own coffee and we can save you a couple bucks because we're not paying the labor. You're not paying the labor to do it and you can make it exactly your way. Uh, the right hand side there, same concept. We're going to be rolling out throughout the summer months, uh, a couple months late, unfortunately, but we're going to do the same thing with smoothie, smoothie machines. Smoothies are the next big thing. And so we've talked with a, one of our vendors that was making a different machine for us, and they're gonna come up with a smoothie machine. They have come up for a, with it. Uh, and we're gonna roll it out to our store so you guys can walk up, touch screen, make your own smoothie. It'll wash between cycles, be ready to go for the next guest. Same thing with the fresh meat. Again, grocery background. Who thought you could have sold ribeye steaks out of a convenience store? Uh, right now we're selling about 40 packages of meat a day per store. And so all of a sudden you're selling semi-loads of ground chuck a week. And that's really where our bread plant, new bread plant is coming from. About half our sales are hot dogs and hamburgers. Well, then you pick up the bun that we've been making for 25 years, and all of a sudden we're out of capacity in our bread plant. And so we're spending another $115 million. And away we go. Because we're family-owned, we can have a little prerogative to make investments. But uh, what, five, six years ago, diesel prices were over $4 a gallon. Everybody in the, company, in the country was having to pay huge shipping costs. Well, we ours aren't quite as bad because we own the diesel infrastructure, but we're still driving 18 million miles a year at that point. So why not convert to uh, CNG? CNG prices today are anywhere from $1.79 to $1.99 a gallon, our gas gallon equivalent, versus uh, diesel's, what, 360 ish right now, depending on the market? Significant cost savings again. And on top of that, it burns much cleaner. Uh, we can run roughly 60 compressed natural gas tractors or one diesel tractor and get the same particulate emissions. Significantly cleaner. And so 90% of our fleet today is running on either compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas. We have chosen very consciously to keep some diesels in the fleet because we sell a little bit of diesel every year. And we need to know how that diesel is reacting in equipment. And so we've kept diesel in the fleet. New stores for Minnesota, again, one of those things that Gramps has always told the entire family, you grow or you die. And so uh, we're going to build about 60 new stores this year all in. Uh, 
30 of those were in acquisition in the Madison and Milwaukee area uh, this last winter. But those are your 11 new stories you'll get in Minnesota. I know Duluth is not in the Boundary Waters, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but those are your 11 new stores this year uh, and a couple here just north of town. And then get into that retention. And this is really what we're known for as this 40% uh, profit sharing program. And when the Reinhardt family sold their share of the company in 1989, he sold his shares actually to the Zitlow family. And so now you had a two thirds, one third ownership. And Don grew up very, very poor. Uh, and he truck driving, thought he went to heaven when he was making 125 bucks a week to support his family. Uh, but I always had this vision that if I ever have the uh, chance to, I'm going to share the money with the people that make it. And so since 1989, he talked to the Hanson family at the time and said, if you agree to a 40% profit sharing program, uh, we'll be we, I'll sell you and we can be 50-50 partners. And so that's what we've done every year since 1989. At the close of our fiscal year, the uh, accountants measure everything up. And uh, regardless of what we make, 40% pre-tax goes to our coworkers. We have 22,000 coworkers in Quick Trip today. They're the ones making us successful. I can run around and talk all I want and sitting around in the office, uh, but it's the blue shirts in the front line, the truck drivers driving down the road, and the people in the DC and production areas that are making it happen. And so we do that uh, simply divide out the salary paid by the number of coworkers, essentially. So everybody gets their, you know, uh, last year, for example, uh, everybody in the company got a 7% bonus at the end of the year. It's whatever the 40% divides out to be. If you're the VP, you get a 7% cash bonus. If you were a coworker who worked 100 hours, whatever that salary came out to be, you got 7% of that. And then uh, beneath that, I was, well, actually didn't put it in there, uh, but we also offer, that's a huge part of our 401k profit sharing program as well as part of this 40%. And so with our 401k program, we actually do a safe harbor program. We guarantee 3%. Um, and then we're actually just in the middle of restructuring it when we onboard new uh, coworkers. Uh, we currently onboard them at 3% of their own going in, and of course they can adjust it at will. Uh, we're gonna jump that up to 5%. Uh, that is automatically when you're un eligible, eligible to you know, the federal guidelines for 401k, this is what's de deducted uh, from your paycheck. We're gonna set you up at 5%. We're gonna guarantee 3%. And then if, depending on how the year goes, we might adjust that as well. And so the three years I've been full-time in the office, my first year I had 7% contribution from Quick Trip. Uh, two years ago, uh, my 401k on, on top, and this is separate from the cash bonus I got, my 401k was 5.8%, uh, and then last year it was 3.5% from the company. And we offer a 401k program to our part-time uh, coworkers as well. Now a lot of that, you just heard me slipping the coworkers and employees back and forth. A lot of times in groups, I'll say employees, but internally it's always coworkers. They're the ones doing the work, they're working alongside of us. And so that's a huge part of what we do and why we do it. Because I look back when I was in college, uh, my senior year when I was working in the store before I was part of the family because I married in 11 years ago, uh, my senior year of college working you know, a part-time job in a store in Platteville, uh, my portion of the profit sharing bonus that year it was a $560 check three weeks before Christmas to a senior in college. <laughs> that went a long way as compared to the jacket and the, um, the ham one of my roommates got, <laughs> which he had to share with us. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I can pitch in a little bit of money and buy the beverages for Christmas supper in our college mm -hmm. house, but the other two guys never got anything. And there's a lot of our coworkers that that's a huge, huge benefit for them is to be able to take that home. And uh, that's another part of our Retention is telling our coworkers exactly what's going on. We have our corporate, uh, our meetings every year in, in December. Uh, we spend three weeks on the road as the management and ownership telling all of our coworkers exactly what's going on. We had uh, 28 meetings last year between the three states that we operated in with an hour long business plan meeting saying this is what's happening at Quick Trip. Uh, and then we pass out the checks at the end of the meeting. It's probably why they come, but along the way <laughs> is that communication. Whether we're doing things well or we're having a poor year, our coworkers know where we stand. And so last year, uh, actually on Wednesday of, this, Wednesday of last week, we had our mid-year business plan meeting. 
Uh, we record that with the AV department, and then we ship it out to all the stores. And we do a condensed version of it for the, the part-time coworkers in the store, but they still have a 12-minute update knowing exactly where we stand after six of our 13 periods. The other big thing our coworkers talk about in terms of retention is a, pr a program that we have called Families Helping Families. It's our own internal 501c3 program where co uh, coworkers can contribute uh, through payroll deductions, and then we've got a committee of coworkers from across the company that decide where and when this money goes. It all stays internally with other coworkers, so I know that when my payroll deduction hits, it goes to coworkers that need help. And so when you look at some of the monumental flooding we've had in the last couple of years, most people don't have flood insurance. Flooding is not covered by insurance, uh, but when you're in Iowa or whether you're in, uh, you know, Duluth has some monumental flooding two weeks apart, we, those coworkers can apply and we can get checks out to them in a matter of weeks helping to cover the costs. And it's all volunteered, it's through the organizations, our own people helping our own people. Uh, you see there are 325 coworkers last year that we helped out, uh, they averaged about $1,200 a check. And again, that's all of our own coworkers you know, giving to their co you know, fellow coworkers. That means we passed out almost $350,000 last year. But it's our people, our coworkers taking care of each other. And that's huge. It's a great sense of camaraderie. Uh, one of the other, and this is just the tip of the cap, but working with communities. You know, when we were up at the ribbon cutting for Vadness Heights, we made some contributions. We'd love to make uh, corporate donations to different things, but then help out in other ways as well. One of those is our retail helper program. Um, so throughout the company, we employ 325 people with some type of intellectual disability. There's plenty that this population can, can do to be productive members of society and fit in. And for many of them, a part-time job at Quick Trip is the first time they've done that. And so if we can do these types of things, we're going to. And the last big thing that we do is we take place in the uh, top workplaces survey. One of your hiring, uh, we'll say, issues up here, and one of your blessings as well as for the top workplaces survey, you have more top workplaces per capita than any other state in the country. Uh, the Star Tribune, we ranked eighth in Minnesota last year. Uh, Milwaukee, the area, we were third. Iowa, we were second. Uh, but we do this as a means not to come up here and tell you how great we are, but we do as a recruitment tool. Because uh, the top workplaces survey is based on the surveys that we send out and our coworkers send back in, and they send them to the top workplaces people. They don't send them to us. Now, a lot of those lists, it's a third coworker surveys and a third this, and that's a third whatever I as the PR guy tell them we're doing. <laughs> uh, this one is completely based on what the coworkers do and say. Uh, Glassdoor, we were looking that up for some stuff last night. Our CEO had a 93% approval rating in Glassdoor. And when we can get those types of things and say, hey, this is a great recruitment tool, uh, this is why you should come to work at Quick Trip. Now, we're in the same boat as you guys are. We're having a hard time getting people. Um, but in 2016, uh, we had 114,000 applications for 4,700 spots. And those first days in for our new assistant store leaders when I was taking them through it, congratulations, you know, you're a four percenter. <laughs> Even if you're not a one percenter, you're a four percenter and we're more selective than any Ivy League college in the country in terms of who we hired in 2016. And so that's huge when you can say that, when you're able to do that. Uh, but those are just some of our things that we use to recruit. I don't want to tell you everything because we need to recruit up here as well. But uh, really, thank you for uh, letting me talk for a few minutes today. Happy to answer any questions over the next few minutes. Uh, if you uh, don't want to ask now, I'll be around afterwards. Uh, that's my office line there and my personal email at work. So you feel free to write those down. I've got plenty of business cards. But more than happy, I think we've got about 10 minutes or so, somewhere in that ballpark left. Happy to take questions. Don. You, uh, you mentioned about your uh, employee venue where they get the 40% profit share. Right. How was that accepted at the beginning, and uh, was that a real challenging discussion point uh, within your family? Uh, in 1989, I wasn't married in yet. <laughs> I was five. Uh, <laughs> but at that point, the G3s G didn't have a say. The G2s, uh, it's their dad. And so when Grant, dad says something, that's the way it's going to be. And at this point in the game, that's always a big discussion point for us, but it always comes back with this is the, the coworkers, they're the ones that run the company, they operate it, they're the ones that make Quick Trip successful. Uh, there's a belief in a, that they better well get the biggest piece of the pie. And that's preached early on to the kids, and it's, a, it's at this point in, the, in our 
uh, family, it's, it's a complete buy-in as well. Uh, but that was a point of friction with some of the other business partners at different times. Uh, and their biggest point of friction, quite frankly, was with the banks. How are you ever going to pay us back if you're giving 40% of your pre-tax profits <laughs> to all your coworkers? Well, if our coworkers are making it successful and we give them the money, they'll get it back, don't worry. And so our coworkers really, it's a point of ownership for them. They get that and understand that. Uh, we did have an ESOP, maybe to better illustrate your point here. We had an ESOP with all of our real estate that we actually ended a few years ago. And that one was a little contentious within the family because that meant a, a huge tax issues for the family if we bought all the real estate back in. Uh, but more importantly, if we control the real estate, we control the course of the company. And we didn't want people passed down the line there, two generations removed, having shares in our real estate not knowing what it is or what it's worth because they moved away. And so we bought that all back, and actually that was a little contentious among the coworkers. Because even though some of our coworkers were getting checks for a quarter million dollars, they realized that if we left that there and they worked another 10 years, it'd be worth that much more. And so even though they're getting huge cash payouts in some courses, in some, it, you know, they, they realized what a value that was and what it was for us. But uh, that, that came out of the 40%. So really what that's been able to do is for us to redistribute the 40% uh, to everybody more equitably. Because to get into the ESOP, you had to have five years. And that was a big chunk of that 40% before previous to that. Uh, you talk about hiring. Yep. You talk a little bit about firing. Firing is not fun. <laughs> um, at Quick Trip, and we really hire for um, a behavioral set. And we hire for who you are, not necessarily what you've done. Uh, we, we do a behavioral based script for our, all of our hiring processes. And so, and our hiring process is actually fairly lengthy. And we believe that if we can make it purposely hard to get into, that'll give us that many more chances to catch them before uh, they get in the company and have an issue to cause harm in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we do fire on a regular basis, though, unfortunately. And we tell all of our coworkers right away, we hired you because you're a good person. Um, you know, now's your chance to, sh to shine and show that. Your parents, your grandparents, most of your personality is shaped by the time you're six years old. So us in the training department, your supervisors, we're here to remind you you're good people. We'll remind you when you're stepping on the lines, but most of it don't make us choose between you and your coworkers. And we tie it right back to the 40%. If you're siphoning enough money, if you're not good for Quick Trip, and you're costing the 22,000 other coworkers a chance at, at money, it, it, then it becomes a lot clearer and a lot easier, even in our manager's eyes and our supervisor's eyes, to make those calls. That person is hurting their coworkers, not just in the daily, but they're hurting all 22,000. The question was expansion. We currently operate in, like I said, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa. Uh, our biggest hindrance to expansion is our f products, really, and our distribution. Um, we deliver to every store every day out of La Crosse. Um, and so to get the truck out and back within DOT regulations, uh, we do a little bit of trailer swapping. We trailer swap in about four cities right now. Uh, for example, to hit Duluth, we trailer swap in either Rice Lake or South St. Paul. That's how we got up to St. Cloud last summer as well. Uh, but really, it's how far out can we stretch this? Uh, we're looking, beginning to explore the edges um, of the Dakotas, up the Upper Peninsula, moving west of 35 in Iowa, south of 80 in Iowa. We're getting to explore those things, but when you look at where we operate right now, uh, we have no stores in Des Moines, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Milwaukee. Now, the biggest city is in the three states we operate in, we don't, have current, don't currently have stores. And so we'd like to fill in some more first and then expand the boundaries because it costs significantly more to do that. Uh, Illinois always comes up because we're only 100 miles away from Illinois. And well, Illinois has three of their last four governors in jail. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure that's a place that we really want to do business. Uh, at some point, we will. Um, uh, and the other point about your expansion is replicating what we have on the cross would probably take about a billion dollars. And so raising a billion dollars, um, I've already asked the banks for quite a bit of m more money than I ever thought I would in my life, especially before I got married. Um, so it's, uh, the expansion at this point is going to be trailer swapping and moving out to the edges. Um, right now we hit about 220 mile radius, 225. Um, we've got a couple stores uh, in going into the Ankeny and Des Moines area in the next couple of years. So now you're pushing 280 miles. Uh, we're trailer swapping in, uh, over in Albert Lee. Um, but really, 
kind of the 250 is about the edge of our border right now and looking to fill in infill from there. Do you see any change in your business model with Circle K buying out the holidays and some of the gas station? Um, quite frankly, um, no. Uh, we see opportunity with that. Holiday was a fantastic operator. They operated very, very well. Uh, Don knew the family for a long, long time. Uh, Circle K out of, is based out of, um, they're owned by Couchetard. That's a Canadian company and they're based out of Quebec. Uh, they have 14,000 C stores throughout North America and Europe. Um, I, mean, I don't think that the holiday stores are going to get the attention they once had, quite frankly, just based on pure numbers. And so the real question for the holiday stores is they had about 350 corporately owned stores and then they had roughly 150 franchisees. And so where do the franchisees go from now? now are they going to stay franchisees of Couchetard? How are the contracts worked out? Are they going to try and sell and get out of the business? What's going to happen to those franchisees? Um, and, and so that's, that's going to be the interesting part of, about the holiday deal and acquisition. Uh, Couchetard has publicly said they don't want to change anything Holiday does. It's one of their better brands. They've gone about 10 different brands throughout. Uh, Circle K, of course, is their biggest brand. Uh, but the Star Tribune ran that article about six months ago uh, before the buyout was publicly announced and most people in the metro area didn't know there's 20 Circle K's in town already and so uh, we're, uh, we're optimistic about it for us. Uh, don't think it was a good move for the C-Store industry as a whole though. Have you been on the TV show Undercover Boss? It sound like it. Uh, I have not. Um, they did approach Don about it and said don't worry we can cover it up, we can hide them, don't worry. Uh, but again, I, as I mentioned, we said our people are our number one priority. Um, Don goes to every single ribbon cutting unless we have to go separate ways. So I went to a district meeting yesterday and he went to the ribbon cutting. Occasionally I go to the ribbon cutting and he goes to the district meeting. And when we go out and do the face-to-face the -face meetings with all of our coworkers to hand out those checks, um, last year with our 22, we had about 21,000 coworkers at the time we did it, uh, we had a 92% attendance rating at those meetings. 92% of our coworkers are there to hear the message. They see Don speak. Uh, he always is in front shaking hands. Now we tell people to get there early to come grab a bite to eat and shake hands with Don and the family members. So uh, we've been approached by them, uh, but we've told them I don't think we can cover Don up well enough no matter the amount of makeup you use. Um, <laughs> he has a very distinct voice. So, And part of it for me is, uh, for me personally, is I look at it in public relations, uh, the unfortunate part about my job is I'm about the number, I am the number two if something goes wrong. And when we've got 27 million miles a year on the road, statistically something will go wrong. Uh, and so I make it my duty, or whether it's production or anywhere else, uh, the ownership really helps and I kind of make it my job to know every aspect of the company. So when I come out, uh, if I ever had to give unfortunate news in a press conference, I have those first line of questions without just, you know, playing dumb and not knowing. I would honestly not know. Because uh, we want to be as sincere as possible with all our people and treat our people well. And so, yeah, we've been approached, but we haven't done it. Uh, having a successful business carried on through multiple generations like you have is very difficult to do. What do you think your success is? And what makes you so successful at doing this? A lot of our success, quite frankly, is Gramps and the 40%. It's a daily reminder uh, that it's not us making the company successful, it's our people making the company successful. Like I said, I've got about 15,000 miles a year windshield time with them and the most utterly f used phrase in the car is, Carl, take care of the coworkers. If you take care of the coworkers, the coworkers will take care of the guests and everybody will be happy. It's really that simple of a business philosophy, philosophy, and it's a matter now of executing it. And so, like I said, Don's 83, but he's still in the office 50 or 60, and so uh, hours a week in that aspect, we're still in the first generation. <laughs> and so we haven't had a lot of that transition, but the second generation, they're the ones that's sharing the board of directors. Uh, and so I, the next few years really will be the, the how do we handle the generational because we haven't had a generational change yet, to be entirely honest. Don's still there calling the shots. He's slowly delegating more and more, but you always make sure you give him a heads up first before you make a decision. <laughs>
thank you for allowing me to come speak with your chamber. Uh, this is really the enjoyable part of my job as I, they opened up with, I used to teach middle school and you guys behave much better. Uh, but it's, it's a great pleasure to always come and, and share the good things that we do and really share the story of the good things of what our coworkers do. So thank you for your time today.